Hello viewers, uh, today's video is going to be a, a quick analysis of this um, failed uh, Whirlpool dishwasher. Uh, I guess you could say your, your main um, pump motor or pump altogether because it's kind of one assembly. Now this motor is not your typical old style where it uses a induction style motor and it uses like a start capacitor or run capacitor um, type of setup. Uh, this actually uses like a, a shaded pole style motor, I guess would be the terms. Um, now, um, I got the dishwasher for free. I didn't pay nothing for it, but I looked the model and all that up online, but it um, is a $700 dishwasher. Um, I got it from a guy. He was going to throw it out, and I asked him right before he was about to uh, throw it in the uh, scrap bin. Uh, and I said, is it broke? And he's like, uh, yeah. And he's like, uh, you want it? And I said, yeah, sure. So I took it home. I uh, didn't really think anything of it. And then, uh, the next day I went out and kind of observed cause this was kind of late in the evening. So, uh, kind of, you know, went in for the night, but the next day I, um, went out and kind of looked around and observed to see, you know, what might've failed or what called, you know, if it worked or not. Uh, I didn't plug it up at the moment, but I just kind of looked at all the, you know, the, workings of it just to kind of see if it was worth fixing and all but I noticed the fill valve solenoid was missing so I initially thought maybe that was the problem so uh, I kind of did a little, little quick rig up um, setup I guess you could say uh, where I just hooked the hose pipe up managed to kind of fit the, the the tube that connects to the solenoid solenoid into the hose pipe and just kind of turn the water on just just a little bit not to where enough pressure would blow it you know blow it back out of the hose just to fill it up until it would uh turn on but it would just keep you know i, I kind of filled it up and the first time i kind of you know i checked it the water level just to make sure it wasn't too high or anything and i uh i checked the uh float switch you know i kind of pushed down on it you know i can hear it click on and off just to make you know so i knew the water level was fine but um like i said then i closed the lid and i pushed start and nothing happened now i could hear relays and stuff inside clicking on and off in the on the control panel but um the pump this thing was not running so i kind of drained all the water out the the drain pump worked uh, just to maybe you know make sure i didn't accidentally disconnect anything and forgot to connect it back up or whatever but uh i took it out uh, brought it in here and i hooked it up uh, input is 120 volts in my case um, and it just kind of did like a little er noise and it just kind of like jumped it went like this and then it turned off and then it kind of did that like five times like it was trying to start and so because I initially thought uh, that this thing was actually dead because as you can see here this is like electronically controlled so it's got some kind of timing module and all that in there so I thought, you know, maybe, oh boy, you know, here we go again. Typical failure of these type of appliances where they got tons and tons of control boards running everything. But I noticed this is just, you know, straight 120 in and that's it. There's no feedback um, information uh, to tell the main board, you know, hey, it's working or whatever. You know, in case where this were to fail, it would say, you know, send that back to the uh, control module and it would throw up an error code to let you know what what component has failed in the appliance uh, and of course you know you'd go back in your instruction manual or look it up online and it would have like a list of error codes but unfortunately this does not have that feature but I figured out the problem the problem is the type of bearing that Whirlpool chose to use in this pump now I'm not hating on Whirlpool. Uh, I'll be honest. In my opinion, they're actually the the best uh, appliance company out there. I've used them for years and years, and I mean, there's washing machines I've seen people have for like over 20 years straight, and no issues whatsoever. Um, but um, unfortunately, this is a case of possibly you know just a simple design flaw, and it's causing a lot of headache and issues for users because for one this is a very expensive dishwasher and two it's something so simple literally probably costs the company two cents for this part uh in case the case the bearing itself and yet it's causing major failure 
uh, because I went online and I looked up this uh, model number of this dishwasher and um, the number one issue was that this pump was failing and one user mentioned he got this model the same model and the pump failed three times in one year so I was like wow you know that's that's bad <laughs> replace you know actually like just imagine you know your washing machine motor failing three times in a year that's pretty high failure rate or uh, a failure rate I should say but like I said, I kind of dug into this pump. Um, as you can see, I already removed the screws. Uh, I'll power it up in a minute. Uh, but it's just something so simple, but yet it causes a big headache for users. Now, um, oh, this came off, so I'm going to reconnect this wire back on and reconnect this wire back on. I'm just using simple alligator clips. Uh, also, you should tape off these two points here because on the circuit board, this is right where the windings go in, uh, or the windings are soldered onto this control board. And so we'll set this down like so. Connecting. And we'll turn it on. As you can see, that thing is just jumping all over the place. Let me try to zoom in there. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, um, upon looking, um, you just pull out these four screws here. Just unplug this from the wall, even though I got it turned off. Um, pull this out, and as you can see, like I said, this is almost like a shaded pole motor. Um, you got your um, your ferrite core, or in this case, the the rotor. Uh, it's a little wet. There is water in here, uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. But um, and all it is is just a north and a south, and in this case is controlled by the electronic module inside. And then right here, I gotta be careful because this has water in it. There is a this little white piece that extends up in here. There is a Hall effect sensor, so it knows whether which position that the rotor is in, or you know which pole of the magnet, and if the rotor in this case is actually spinning or it's been it's jammed. Now I'm gonna pause the video. I need to get a rag real quick, so I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Um. What was I saying? Oh yeah, the shaded pole motor. Um, and I think this just controls, you know, the speed. It keeps it at a consistent speed. I'm not sure why they need, the, why they thought that they would need. I'll go ahead and disconnect all these. A control module in this case to run this. Uh, I'm guessing because this would draw a lot of power, a shaded pole motor this big, and it would be inefficient. So I'm wondering if they're using like some kind of variable frequency drive here. But there's no loud squealing or anything. And actually, you can hear it. It runs as like a 60 hertz hum. So I don't know. But because um, your drain pump is the same style motor, but there's no control. It's just straight 120 in, and you got two winding or this well windings. I guess it's one whole winding, but. Um, but yeah, and it runs just fine on 120 volts. But um, but yeah, so initially, like I said, what happened is, as you can see here, you can probably already see it's magnetic. Pull one of my alligator clips. Um, you got your rotor here. And, uh, oh, uh, before I do that, uh, so how to remove the impeller is you're going to hold the rotor like this and then you're going to take the impeller and you're going to turn it counterclockwise uh, it may be a little bit harder when you first do it uh, if you're like if it hasn't been you know from the factory and you haven't messed with it but I've already messed with this so I didn't put this on tight but and then it comes off like that here's your impeller and then your little insert where they got the little nut that screws on and that slides off like so and this is the bearing that failed uh, if you look at it, you can see it's kind of oval shaped, and you know, as you you know, as you know, a bearing is not supposed to be like that. 
So, uh, but also if you look, you can see where there's a lot of material on this side here, but you see right where the far side where the oval's going this direction, there's like hardly any material. That's because that's how much it's done eroded or ate away at that bearing. Now, the bearing in here is like a ferrite. It's the same, I guess, material as this rotor here. But if you look at the rotor, you can see the back side of it right here is actually it's smooth hopefully I can get the camera to focus that close I mean there's a little bit of imperfections on it but it's nothing too crazy nothing too bad or anything like that but if we come over here to the bearing that fell you can see there's like really really bad uh, deep grooves in there uh, you can see where the shaft goes from shiny to like really scratchy and you can actually feel these are like really deep scratches if you run your fingernail across it and then it goes to like really smooth there's like nothing and then it's like bad <laughs> um, and you can also see that black stuff that's on there that remnants is actually from the bearing material that's actually rubbed into the plastic and uh, embedded itself in the plastic fibers uh, so yeah that's it's not good now um, the back bearing is fine I've actually you know like I said I've put it in here and there is no play well when it's on it's just the top part and of course you can well you can't really tell from here but if you look inside you can also see where the motor uh, let me turn that down if I can get this to focus if you look inside there come on uh, you'll see the plastic. Hold on, let me use this hand. I try to see. I'm trying to get the flashlight up in there for you, for you so you can see that. As you can see. Ah, alright, hold on a second. I'm gonna have to figure this out. Alright, I managed to get it managed to get it just right. If you see right here the plastic. the light if it'll focus now it's not going to focus for me but if you look right here you can see the plastic is smooth but then you see right here there is a really really deep groove there we go there's a little bit better and as you can hopefully you can you guys can see especially like right there there it is you see those really deep scratches but then it like suddenly stops there we go you see how you got those really deep scratches to the right but then right to the middle to the left the plastic is smooth what's causing that is when the bearing fails and this rotor is spinning it's causing it to sag and catch that plastic and rub against it also when I took this cover off there was water in here, which I think is supposed to be normal, I'm pretty sure, because it kind of helps lubricate these bearings, because these, are, these aren't like a ball bearing or anything. It smelled like rotten eggs and raw sewage. It was very nasty, very disgusting, and then it had a lot of scale buildup inside. And my theory is what happened is that bearing began to fail. Also, if you look, when it, the, the rotor sets in there, it sets in here a little... Oh, it's backwards a little bit like this it's not like right up against this but there's water can get in behind it and because that uh this is on the pressurized side it's forcing water in here but also food particles and scale build up from hard water and eventually what happens is it begins to eat away at that bearing when it gets down in between that bearing even though there's a seal on the outside but there's nothing on the inside here it's just you know perfect fit or it may be enough to where allow the water to go into it to kind of help lubricate. But when you have dirty water or hard water, it doesn't really make a difference because eventually it's, it's going to still cause it to fail because then that's, those particles act like uh, little pieces of sand and slowly grind away the bearing. And also as the bearing particles itself, you know, pieces, you know, the little powder or the, the material from the bearing also gets in there and it speeds up that process and eventually it just it it self-destructs you know it's like a domino effect 
Now you can say, oh, there's a filter in there. Yeah, true, but that filter is just the fil designed to filter out large particles. It's not designed, it's not like a reverse osmosis system or whatever. It, you know, it's not designed to block out tiny microscopic particles or, you know, little pieces, tiny pieces of sand. It may help somewhat, but not enough, you know, in this case. And so, like I said, if food particles get in there, and then, of course, if you're using hard, you know, if you have well water and it's, you know, hard water or whatever, um, that can also play a, uh, a factor in uh, causing this bearing to fail really bad or to fail and to fail to a point to where it causes this rotor to jam up against the inside of the casing here and not to run anymore, to run properly, but also to not run at all. Uh, so unfortunately that is a design flaw, uh, I have found, um, in this style of dishwasher, uh, from Whirlpool, from Whirlpool. Now, I don't know, I can, you can say, oh, well, they could just use brass. Yeah, I don't think so, because then, you know, stuff like copper and brass, you know, degrades, especially like copper, for example, you know, when it gets wet, it creates copper oxide, that blue stuff, aka it, it, it corrodes. And so I don't think brass, usually a typical sleeve bearing, that's what this is. This this is not a ball bearing, this is a sleeve bearing. But they're using a, a really bad material, in my opinion, or just a setup altogether. And I think they should just redesign it or something in their next, however long they're going to carry this model or series. They, the next series, they should go with something different, in my opinion, with a, a better bearing something that's going to be more resilient to you know harsh conditions like this in terms of like hard water where stuff can get in the bearing it's not going to be able to damage it as easily as this ferrite stuff now this bearing does pop out maybe it'll actually like this and as you can see there is a there's a little seal, a little O-ring that goes around it, but as you can see up close, you can see how this is oval shaped, where it's gone off to the side, uh, where this bearing has failed. So, uh, unfortunately, like I said, this is most likely a design flaw as they use a poor choice of material for the bearings, and it's caused, you know, the whole system to, to act up in this case. And not work properly. Now the whole entire pump assembly altogether is like fifty bucks on Amazon. It's not bad, but I mean, literally a part it probably costs two cents or less. You know that 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 sucks. You know, especially for the consumer who spend hundreds of dollars on this product, and you know it prematurely fails. Um. And you can say, oh, well, they have a manufacturer's warranty. Yes, but, I mean, just like the other guy, I mean, would you want to keep replacing your pump you know, three times a year, every year? No. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. So, not that it's it's hard, but, you know, the hassle, you know, the downtime and stuff. So, most people, you know, this kind this can drive away customers from your, your products. Uh, from, you know, simple, silly stuff. Or mishaps. But um, anyway, uh, I think I pretty much covered everything. Um, and uh, yeah, so I uh, appreciate you uh, watching the video. And I uh, guess I'll wait for the next video to come out or see you next time. But uh, thanks for watching.